more made in Canada. G'day guys, how's it going? My name is Aussie Tash and it's time for another video of Made in Canada where we learn about really cool Canadian inventions and the impact they've had on this world. Guys, if you're loving the content on these videos, I highly recommend you go and check out the channel Canada's History. It's full of great content about Canadian history, inventions and so much more. Really excited to get into this episode. Let's go. Made in Canada, Cronconol. Made in Canada. Creative, innovative, and sometimes mind-boggling contributions Canadians have made to the world. It may have sister versions around the world, but the game of Crokinole as we know it today was likely born in southwestern Ontario. The earliest known Crokinole board was created in 1876 in Sebastopol, Ontario by Eckhart Wetlofer as a birthday gift for his five-year-old son Adam. Wetlofer was well known for his woodworking skills, including decorative work on sleighs and wagons. Other crokinole boards from this time period have been found in the same part of Ontario, though the game was patented in New York in 1880. Crokinole is played on round or octagonal boards by two players or teams. Players flick discs across the board, attempting to knock off their opponent's discs and to place theirs as close as possible to the board's center. The octagonal design was intended to prevent boards from rolling when propped against a wall for storage. Okay. Similar versions of the game, including British Shovelboard and East Indian Karom, are considered precursors. The World Crokinole Championships is held each year in Tavistock, Ontario, near Sebastopol. Okay. Crokinole. Can't say that I've played it or that I've seen a game similar to like that in Australia. The boards, they look really, really cool, don't they? Guys, leave a comment. Do you play this game often? Do you play it as a child? Tell me your stories. I know the one game that we did play a lot as children that was made in Canada, and that was Trivial Pursuit. Loving these clips. Let's keep on going. Made in Canada. Creative, innovative, and sometimes mind-boggling contributions Canadians have made to the world. At a time when ovens used wood or gas for heat... Thomas Ahern amazed the world by chaining electricity and using it to cook a meal. As co-owner of an electrical company in Ottawa, Ontario, he was devoted to promoting the wonders of electricity. In 1892, his electric oven was big news. Oh, Made yeah. of bricks, it stood six feet high and six feet wide. Wow. Two electric heaters provided steady heat and covered peepholes let Ahern watch the food inside bake to perfection. That's cool, man. The first meal he cooked was for a high society crowd at the Windsor Hotel. He made 21 dishes from trout to strawberry puffs, and guests were so impressed that the Windsor Hotel immediately ordered an electric oven for its own use. That's pretty cool. In time, people around the world would come to prefer electric ovens for their easy use and their dry, even heat, which is ideal for baking or roasting. Well, that's a mighty cool invention, isn't it? The electric oven. Thank you, Canada, for that. I love my electric oven. I really can't imagine using a gas oven. I do know a couple of people that do. Gas in Australia is really, really expensive. So an electric oven is probably the better way to go because you can use your solar panels and everything like that. But wow, what an invention that changed the world this one was. And I guess you use it all the time to make poutine. Let's keep on going. Made in Canada. Creative, innovative, and sometimes mind-boggling contributions Canadians have made to the world. As Plato said, necessity is the mother of invention. And what could be more necessary or satisfying on a fishing outing than a chocolate bar? Okay, I agree with that. It's a necessary Gilbert item. and James Ganon started the Ganon Brothers Limited Candy Factory in St. Stephen, New Brunswick in 1873. Wow. The story goes that James' son Arthur Ganon and his friend George, a Ganon candy maker, wanted a way to take chocolates with them on their fishing trips without the sticky fingers and pocket mess. In 1910, oh, they concocted a mixture of yellow fudge and coconut, nice. which was covered with Ganon's best chocolate and peanuts. Little did they realize this tasty indulgence, which was humbly wrapped in cellophane and bore a five-cent price tag, would become so popular. Five cents, nice. The five-cent chocolate nut bar became a convenient treat not only for fishermen, but also for soldiers at the front during the First World War. In 1920, it was repackaged and named Palomine, a name that was thought to imply loyalty and faithfulness. Mm -hmm. Although American candy maker Milton S. Hershey produced a chocolate bar around the same time, 
It was a Canadian manufacturer that produced the first chocolate nut bar confection. Okay. This comfort food endures today. Chocolate nut bars, the Palamine bar. Is that bar still available? You guys know that I've tried a few Canadian chocolate nut bars. Absolutely love them. The Mr. Big Bar, that was one of my favorites. Thank you, Canada, for chocolate nut bars. What a great invention. Just so you know, guys, unfortunately, the Hershey bar is sold in Australia in the chocolate form, in the syrup form, and in the ice cream form. It's just something. Don't know if you guys would like to know, but just a little bit of information for you. Loving these clips. Let's keep on going. Made in Canada. Creative, innovative, and sometimes mind-boggling contributions Canadians have made to the world. IMAX, the large motion picture format shown in theaters around the world, had its beginnings in Canada's National Film Board. That's cool. And in the cool. creative energy showcased at Montreal's Expo 67. Oh, no way! Graham Ferguson and Roman Kreuter had both been interns at the NFB, and Kreuter was employed there when he proposed a multi-screen experimental film for the Expo. Ferguson, meanwhile, worked as an independent filmmaker and was asked to make his own film for Expo 67. He approached his former schoolmate, Robert Kerr, to set up a production company. At Expo 67, oh, that. experimental film projections using many screens and projectors in different arrangements wow. was a huge success. Absolutely. And the Fuji company asked Kreuter to participate in Expo 70 in Osaka, Japan. Wow. He and Ferguson discussed the possibility of using a single projector to improve image quality and reduce complications. With Kerr, they formed the multi-screen corporation which soon changed its name to IMAX. That's cool, man. The company developed a large format projector and camera in time to show the film Tiger Child in Osaka. IMAX. We have IMAX theaters in Australia everywhere. What a cool invention IMAX was. Cheers for that, Canada. And speaking of Expo 67, I've got a few videos coming up on the Expo 67. Really looking forward to dropping them. So guys, stay tuned. The goalie mask. <laughs> I love it. Made I love it. in Canada. Creative, innovative, and sometimes mind-boggling contributions Canadians have made to the world. The story of NHL goaltender Jack Plant having his face split open by a puck and returning to the game wearing a protective mask oh. is legendary. Wow. But Bill Birchmore the man behind the piece of fiberglass that revolutionized hockey is less recognized. Oh, that's a shame. Birchmore, who worked for Fiberglass Canada, watched Plant make a save with his forehead in 1958. And the image of a dazed, bleeding Plant remained with him the next day. Staring at a mannequin head, he was inspired to experiment with fiberglass cloth and polyester resin. Plant had worn other masks in practice and initially resisted Birchmore's idea, but agreed to it at the urging of Montreal Canadiens medical staff. That's cool. During the summer of 1959, Birchmore made a plaster mold of Plant's face. Of his face? He then layered sheets of resin-soaked fiberglass cloth on the mold. The result was lightweight, virtually unbreakable, and only 3 millimeters thick. Plant first wore the mask in an NHL game on November 1st, 1959. Wow. Throughout the 1960s, as more goalies followed his lead, the mask changed the way the game was played. Mm. Goalies no longer had to remain upright and could drop to the ice without fear of facial injury. That is a really cool invention. Just to clarify, were they using their forehead to stop the puck without a mask before the goalie mask was invented? That is brutal, man. Hockey is brutal. So the goalie mask, what a great invention. Because it's used everywhere, isn't it? All forms of hockey all around the world are using the goalie mask. That has potentially saved thousands and thousands of lives. Sports-related concussions in Australia at the moment is highly topical right now. Our football players, they don't wear headgear or anything. So they're getting concussed all the time. They're bringing in all these new rules and they're talking about ways to make it better. Mate, they should all just wear headgear like you guys do. Made in Canada. 
that was the video for today. I really, really enjoyed it. Loving these clips and learning more about the cool inventions that have come from Canada and how they've changed the world. Guys, if you like the video, please make sure to jump on, smash the like button, leave a comment, and remember to subscribe. That really helps me out. Cheers from down under. Take care. Bye.